Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Britain's place in the EU. They call it the Brexit scenario, and with a referendum on the way, Britain leaving the European Union is a real possibility. We look at the economic and geopolitical implications of the EU without UK. And also this week, the fight back in the skies. The Gulf carriers take their battle over accusations of unfair subsidies straight to the United States. We hear from the boss of Qatar Airways as he speaks out. So the pollsters really got it wrong in the UK, didn't they? No coalition building, no kingmakers. Instead, an outright majority for the Conservative Party and a very surprised British electorate. So it begs the question, could they also be wrong when Britain holds a referendum on its membership of the European Union? To be fair, that vote is potentially more than two years away. David Cameron's promised it by the end of 2017. So the outcome right now is quite unpredictable. But that's potentially two years of uncertainty. Businesses will be operating and trading with Europe without knowing whether they'll still be part of that union in the near future. In the meantime, Prime Minister Cameron wants to start renegotiating some of the terms of the UK's membership, things like migration within the EU, stopping the payment of benefits to new migrants, and the repatriation of some laws from Brussels back to the UK Parliament in Westminster. Just those factors alone tell you a lot about which direction this new UK government is already pulling in. But there are a lot of economic consequences for both Britain and the EU which need considering. Jobs is the obvious place to start. As many as 4 million jobs in the UK are dependent on EU trade and 8 million jobs in the European Union could be at risk from reduced trade, which is no good in a block where unemployment is running at 12%. Now already we see the UK's share of exports to the European Union falling. In six years it's gone from 54 to 46%, which means the UK currently runs a balance of payment deficit with the EU of... Uh, 39 billion pounds, which is about 61 billion dollars. In short, Britain's importing more than it is exporting. So imagine if the UK left and more trade barriers went up. Well, in a worst case scenario, the UK would stand to lose 50 billion pounds or 78 billion dollars a year. Now, for now, Britain's partners are willing to offer some concessions. They want it to remain a part of the union. But this is and always has been an uncomfortable relationship. With a special report for counting the cost, here's our correspondent, Lawrence Lee. Travel to most European capitals and you'll see the blue starry flag of the European Union. But not in London, not anywhere. At times, this place keeps its relationship with Europe a slightly embarrassed secret, like a relative with a nasty illness. And with David Cameron's victory in the elections, the path has now opened to a referendum on British membership of the EU that is crucial both for the future of Europe's economy and for the soul of Britain. That's a big responsibility for any Prime Minister. David Cameron has a, has a choice. He needs to get enough reform to make it credible and sound like he's managed to change the direction of the EU. To, to one which UK public opinion could be more could be more uh, more at home in. On the other hand, if he asks for too much and 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 tries to tries to um, gain something that would be very popular with UK public opinion, the chances of gaining it in Europe are less. So he has a balancing act. The case for staying in Europe has, in particular, created something of a moral dilemma for the banking sector. The big banks complain endlessly about too much European regulation, which can end up with them being fined for maximising profits, even if that has led at times to very dodgy practices. Yet the current state of play has also allowed for London to become Europe's preeminent financial centre. And so what if a British exit, a Brexit, were to stifle inward and outward trade, weaken sterling, make London less powerful? None of that sounds too good when the FTSE has been trading above 7,000 and the banks are feeling comfortable with a new Conservative administration. The UK is very good at exporting financial services. The most recent trade data of only last week showed quite clearly that although the UK is pretty rubbish at exporting goods, we're excellent at ex exporting financial services. And of course, a lot of that is to Europe. Now, if we don't have that one market that we can sell into, that will make uh, the UK financial services industry concerned about what will replace uh, membership of the EU. 
Added to this is the site on the horizon of TTIP, the huge trade deal being brokered secretly in Brussels, which will liberalize markets between the US and European Union. The left hates it for its potential effect on workers' rights, but big business is all for it, leaving Europe would surely cast the UK entirely adrift. That's why people like this new Conservative MP want to stay in a reformed European Union. In the election, he won the singular prize of beating into second place Nigel Farage, the leader of the anti-EU UK Independence Party. So his arguments evidently have a resonance. When you ask people you know, what their concerns are about the EU, it is about the way it's extended itself into justice and armies and currencies and all these things that people didn't think they were getting into when they voted yes to stay in what was then the European community. So if we can shave off these things that people in Britain and I think people across most of the EU do not want and pair it back to being far more about free trade and friendship, then I, th I think that will be very much in tune with what the British people want. The other group lobbying against the Brexit in Westminster comes from Scotland. This new block of 56 MPs from the Scottish National Party will demand that Scotland, if not the whole of the UK, stays in Europe. In numbers terms, they're small compared to the Conservatives, but they still have the nuclear option of calling another independence referendum if they don't get their way. The First Minister put forward an idea of a double lock, that all four parts of the UK would have to vote the same way. That was the right thing to do. Should that not be granted, should England vote to leave and Scotland vote to stay, that would clearly change the constitutional furniture upon which the no side in the referendum was fought. The SNP argues that Scottish industry, fisheries, oil, tourism, whatever else you can imagine, relies on the free movements of people and simplicity of paperwork membership of the EU involves. They would say the same applies to English business too. Of course, whatever the received wisdom about a large section of the United Kingdom population being inherently anti-European, it is now a fact, given the makeup of the new parliament, that there are a lot of people here, a substantial parliamentary bloc, who are absolutely insistent that the UK has to stay in the EU for jobs and economic security. The question is, to what extent can this SNP bloc influence government's opinion here? Against all those arguments is something less tangible but just as powerful. Public opinion, primarily English, that lumps in membership of the European Union with being overrun by unwanted foreigners, legal rights for terrorists, all sorts of other supposed horrors. The UK Independence Party won nearly four million votes, mostly in England, on this sort of arguments. UKIP's one MP is in the coastal town of Clacton, where his supporters recently told us things like this. I really want to see something done about things like human rights and all this rubbish, you know. Well, there's, 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 there's too many human rights. Yeah, I do. Yeah. That's that's terrible, some of the things that go on, they get away with. They've got to sort this immigrant problem out once and for all. There's too many immigrants. There's too many immigrants, yes, coming in. They've got to stop it. We're a small island. Yeah. We can't cope with what we've got. So for the time being, European migrants plough the fields of England, accepting wages that are so low that domestic workers turn their noses up at them. But their graft is good for the profit margin, and that's a powerful lobbying force. Yet so is UKIP's so-called People's Army, die-hard patriots who would prefer a smaller economy in a country they would see as truer to its heritage. Lawrence Lee for Counting the Cost in London. And so to our feature guest, who's returning to Counting the Costs this week, Roger Bootle. He's the Managing Director of Capital Economics in London. We've spoken in the past about his book, uh, The Trouble with Europe, which is now getting a paperback run, I believe, Roger. Nice to see you. I'm going to start with a word which I really don't like, but, you know, it's been coined and it's out there, Brexit. So let's use it once and, and ask you, as a man who knows about Europe, how real is the possibility of this so-called British exit? Oh, I think it's a real possibility. I don't think myself it's the most likely outcome. Uh, David Cameron's a very skilled negotiator and politician, as we've just seen in the latest UK election, not to be underestimated. Uh, there is actually, hidden beneath the surface, quite a lot of support on the continent for the idea that uh, the EU does need reforming. I think the real problem he's got is that the degree of reform really radical stuff that's going to be necessary to satisfy the Eurosceptics in his own party and to deflect the challenge from UKIP, which is still there, the UK Independence Party. That sort of degree of change really needs 
treaty change, mm. change to the treaties of the EU. And that's what the leaders of the EU think they're not prepared to give. But you, you could argue that whether the UK uh, leaves the EU or not uh, in two years' time, that means we're looking at at least two years of, of uncertainty. I would think if I was a, a, a business owner in the UK who, who did a lot of trade with European countries, I'd be worried right now. I'm striking deals and doing business with Europe without knowing what the future is going to be. Yeah, there's something in that argument, but I think, frankly, not a lot. Uh, it's quite clear that if Britain were to leave the EU, frankly, nearly everything would carry on exactly the same as before. We currently do a lot of our trade with the rest of Europe. We carry on doing a lot of our trade with the rest of Europe. Whether or not there was some sort of free trade agreement, I think the most likely thing is, actually, if Britain did leave the EU, then we would have some sort of special trade deal, which would mean that all those businesses in Britain that have very close links and ties with Europe would be left largely unaffected. Now, it's possible it wouldn't be quite like that, but even if we didn't have a special deal, uh, we would continue doing a huge proportion of our trade with what is now the EU. Yeah, of course. Logic would dictate that because Europe isn't going anywhere and it would remain the closest trading area. But Roger, there are a lot of numbers out there uh, which talk about potential losses if more trade barriers go up. £50 billion a year is one figure. Apparently the UK could, could lose that much in a worst case scenario uh, if these trade barriers do go up. I mean, it, it, it will make life somewhat more difficult, won't it? Well, possibly a bit more difficult. Numbers, numbers, numbers. The world's full of people who profess to be experts <laughs> pulling numbers out of the air. You've got to be careful with numbers. I mean, I've looked at this issue very closely, and in my book I do, I think, give a pretty fair account of the range of estimates that has come out. You get on the other side of the account, by the way, some pretty hefty estimates of the gains to Britain from coming out of the EU. I think those are extreme as well. In the end, there won't be, I think, a great deal of difference. Does the Scotland factor play into this at all, Roger? The fact that we could be looking at a breakup of the, Euro of the United Kingdom at the same time or, 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 or before an EU exit? Yeah, I think this is a very tricky issue indeed. Uh, clearly, the UK is in, in peril, I think, because of the strength of nationalism in Scotland. However, one shouldn't overreact, I think, to this election result. The SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, swept the board in Scotland, winning, I think, it's 56 out of 59 seats. But if you look at the share of votes, actually, it only won half the votes in Scotland. Mm -hmm. At the general election before this one, as many people in Scotland voted, not Labour, voted Conservative as voted for the Scottish National Party. And, of course, in the referendum last September, uh, the SNP's call for independence, uh, that was lost quite comprehensively. Roger, let's start widening things out uh, a little bit to the rest of Europe. I mentioned Brexit before, which of course derived its name from Grexit, the idea of a Greek exit. Uh, is that still a possibility? You know, whilst we sort of switch our focus like this, is the idea of that Greek exit still sort of bubbling on? I mean, arguably it's been bubbling on for, for many years now. Yes, of course, the word Grexit uh, usually refers to Greek exit from the Euro rather than from the EU, of whereas course. Brexit, Britain not being in the Euro, of course, mm. is about Britain's exit from the EU. Yes, I think Brexit is very much still a risk. In fact, more than that, I think it's become a lot more likely than it seemed even a few years ago. And I think what happens then is time, time is what really causes these issues to play out. Mm. During the last several years, austerity has been pursued. There's been time for Greece to get over this, time for the European leaders to moderate, time for the Greek government to be a bit more emollient. And all that time has brought, in fact, no progress on these things at all. The Greek position is really desperate. And I think we're running out of time now. I think we're running towards the point at which one side or the other is going to say enough. Okay, final thought from you then, Roger, on the current direction that Europe is taking. I'm specifically referring to the idea of quantitative easing, the move that was finally brought in by the ECB. In your opinion, has it had an impact? Uh, if not, will it have an impact? Well, I've always taken a non-extreme position 
on quantitative easing, uh, surrounded by economists who, on the one hand, some of them seem to think it's the answer to a maiden's prayer. You just uh, press the button, pour all this money into the system and everything comes right. And on the other hand, people who think that uh, quantitative easing is the work of the devil. Uh, I, I think in monetary conditions that exist today, that's to say with a financial system, the banks, are not broken but very very severely damaged i don't think qe is actually that effective okay. now in um, the eurozone they didn't have an awful lot of room for maneuver didn't have that many policy instruments to put into play once interest rates had come very low so i think it's been the right thing to introduce quantitative easing but you shouldn't expect too much of it now what's happened so far is that there has been a revival in the eurozone economy it's currently looking a bit stronger actually in the first quarter than either the us or the uk and that's being associated with qe i doubt myself actually whether qe has got that much to do with it a bit perhaps via the lower exchange rate for the euro i think that the re re revival in the eurozone is more to do with lower oil prices as we go forward though with the central bank pumping in some more money yes i think on balance that's going to help a bit but can that be expected to cure the eurozone's fundamental problems no roger Bertel with his thoughts on the trouble with europe great talking to you roger thank you Thank you. Pleasure. Now, in part two of the program this week, we want to return to a story from a few weeks ago. The ongoing battle for the skies over the United States. You might remember this one. The big three U.S. airlines accusing the big three Gulf carriers of unfair competition. They say Emirates, Qatar and Etihad would be nowhere without the $42 billion in subsidies they allegedly receive from their governments. The Gulf carriers deny they've been subsidised, but US lawmakers are taking it all very seriously. They're pushing for the government to freeze agreements that allow the Gulf Airlines access to US skies. The research filed with the US Congress also shows US airlines have received $155 billion in subsidies of their own, dating back to 1918. When we first covered the story, we heard from one of the smaller Gulf Airlines, which very much supported its regional rivals. This week, we hear from one of the big players themselves. Qatar Airways CEO Akbar al Bakr was in Washington, D.C., talking to lawmakers there. His airline alone has been accused of receiving $16 billion in state subsidies. Interesting, too, that one of those airlines opposed to the Gulf carriers is his own One World Alliance partner. So that's not going down too well. Akbar al Bakr sat down for a chat with our Washington correspondent, Shihab Ritanzi. There was an interesting statement from an Obama administration official quoted anonymously in the Washington Post. Uh, that official said, nothing is imminent, and then added, the foreign policy and military implications have yet to be discussed. What do you think that official was referring to? I'm not a politician, so I don't want to respond to those uh, political uh, responses. I am the chief executive of an airline, and from the airline point of view, what I have to see is that there is no harm that is uh, uh, the allegation, and at the same time, we are serving the wider people of this great country, United States. We are providing people uh, seamless travel experience. We are providing them high standards of in-flight product. We are giving them uh, a, a, a travel experience that they wouldn't get from anybody else. Right, but it was difficult not to think of the fight between the UAE and Canada over landing rights at Ottawa, which ended up with the Canada losing a lease on an airbase in Dubai. Uh, you know, uh, different countries behave uh, with a different way. In Qatar, we always deal with uh, things with a very, very uh, stable mind, and uh, um, we address issues which are always in the best interest of both the partners. So let's go back to the, the specific allegations. The, the big three in the USA, they hired a team of forensic accountants to go through uh, Qatar Airways' finances, and they found uh, that your airline had received $16 billion of subsidies since 2004. Is that true? No, that is not true. First of all, they are not subsidy. And whatever amount we have received, which is not what they are uh, alleging, uh, are pure uh, equity. They don't understand. You see, it is uh, like a, a lawyer defending a criminal uh, in, in, in the, uh, or, or defending a, a case will always raise the bar to, to uh, get to a certain point. But what he, they, are being, uh, they are alleging against us is incorrect. Whatever we have received is a legitimate 
equity. But you have received by, billions by, of dollars. Yes, we have received billions of dollars. Uh, the same way uh, most of the European carriers on, on whose behalf they are raising these issues have also received a lot more than us. We'll come back to that in a moment, but, but, but they did produce these forensic accountants' uh, statements, some prepared by Ernst & Young, the auditor, which talk of these loans, these government loans, as being non-interest-bearing and having no specific repayment terms. That, that does sound like a subsidy, doesn't it? Not at all. Uh, the government is the owner of the airline, and they put uh, equity into the airline. Why should they ask for interest on the equity? I mean, this is bizarre. Don't you think so? Let me talk to you about... Uh, these uh, issues that they raised. Actually, what they are referring to are technical issues which a normal auditor asks uh, from, uh, from the company has no relevance to the points that they have raised. What they have done is they have ring-fenced all those allegations in a way to really sound that it was the end of the world. But actually, they are misleading statements. And they know very well that they are misleading but they are just being used to justify their argument. But, but in the current climate isn't, for example, or would $16 billion in government subsidies it's be market distorting? Billion. But it's not $16 billion. Right. This is what they say, right. but it is not $16 billion. So can we see how much you have received? Will that help? Well, we will respond to the uh, U.S. government when we give our responses to, to all those uh, unfounded allegations. You're always very vociferous in uh, your denial of subsidies, but are subsidies necessarily a a bad thing for a national airline or, or do you think they are market distorting and that's why you're so vociferous in denying that you're receiving uh, subsidies? Well, I cannot talk about other airlines that require subsidies, but as far as I'm concerned, it is not subsidy. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of their alliance partners on whose behalf they are waging these allegations against us are heavily subsidized by their governments, but because it suits them they don't want to talk about them. I could give you a lot of uh, names here, but I'm not uh, uh, privy to all these arguments that they so are. Let's develop that thought then. You're suggesting that this isn't really about American Airlines at all. They're just simply doing a favor for European Airlines? Absolutely. When they mention that there is harm to them, what is the harm? When they don't operate to any of the routes that we operate to where we carry these American passengers. As a matter of fact, it's a two-way street. We are bringing a lot of tourists to the United States. Uh, the, 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 the contribution that Qatar Airways made over the last year alone is very close to 900 million uh, US dollars to the, to the GDP. I mean, these are the things that they are not considering. What they are talking about is on an issue where they don't serve. They don't serve the network where we carry the passengers. So what is the harm? I really don't understand, other than them fighting a, a, a proxy issue for somebody else. But then when you say that the CEO of American Airlines has been uh, deceived, I think was your word. What, I mean, yes, exactly. He's having the wool pulled over his eyes by European well, Airlines? Well, uh, well by, by certain individuals here. I mean, why should he get into this bandwagon where he does not operate to any destinations that we operate to out of United States? I'm an alliance partner of him. I co-chair with him. I contributed to his revenues. So what is the reason for him to get into this issue? I don't understand. But you must it's have very some thoughts. What, what do you think it might be? Well, I don't. I'm sure that when I have the opportunity to talk to him face to face, he will realize that, uh, that uh, it is an issue that he should have never been part of. I mean, the person in their JV that is really should raise the issue is IAG. And they actually are distancing themselves. They have even withdrawn from AEA because of these allegations. So you can see how serious this matter is, uh, is, is getting. And it is, frankly speaking, just a waste of everybody's time. Never one to hold back is the Akbar al there. That That is our show for this week. Plenty more for you online, though, at aljazeera.com slash ctc. It takes you straight to our page which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on when you'd like. Uh, you can also get in touch with us by tweeting either me, at Kamal AJE. Uh, our business editor is at Abid Oliver Ali. And you can use the hashtag AJCTC as well. Or just drop us an email. Counter the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. 
But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news in Al Jazeera is next.